Good evening. Welcome to our YouTube live series. Uh, my name is Lindsay Wright. I am a network director for cardiovascular programs at Honor Health, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Gillespie joining us um, for a great night to bring awareness to November, which happens to be Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and we are just really thrilled to be having a discussion to talk to all of our community members about raising awareness around lung cancer and why we should all really know more about the great things that we're doing here at Honor Health. So welcome, Dr. Gillespie. Thanks, Lindsay. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So you know, actually, Lung Cancer Awareness Month is November, but then there are some other things as well. Uh, it is also COPD Awareness Month, and then uh, November 18th is the uh, Great American Smokeout. So anybody who's thinking about quitting smoking, this is the month that we've set aside for that as well. Yeah. And even better, you know, Christmas is just around the corner. Exactly. So, um, Dr. Gillespie, you are new here to Honor Health and actually new to Arizona. So tell us a little bit about um, your medical practice, where you came from, and kind of what brought you to Arizona. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I've been here, um, you know, it's been almost eight months now, um, and uh, I, was, uh, I was recruited by, um, by Honor Health and by the uh, Heart and Lung Surgery Group to come and um, um, develop the lung oncology program here. Um, I started out um, going to medical school uh, at, uh, at New York University up in Manhattan, um, where there's a really great CT surgery program there, and that's what inspired you know, my, uh, my uh, initial journey um, I ended up doing my uh, general surgery residency at UT Southwestern in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, where um, um, there's a, a great group down there and uh, developed an inter interest in bronchoscopy and some other minimally invasive uh, surgical techniques. And uh, ended up doing a fellowship uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina um, with uh, Francis Robachek, who uh, nobody who's a normal person is gonna know this, uh, but uh, Francis Robachek was the, uh, the chairman of cardiac surgery um, at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte for 50 years, I think. He was from Hungary. He came here in the 1960s and became a very you know, famous uh, CT surgeon and just an interesting, interesting human being. Um, you know, for those who don't know, if uh, you know, anybody who has gone into the specialty of CT surgery is a little unique oftentimes and so and he was a he was a real special one but he was a uh, one of those giants of uh, of the field and so it was a real pleasure to uh, to learn from him um, one story that i like about him uh, the most um, he, this was back in the 70s before there was like cpr had even been taught um, you know before we knew anything about defibrillation and this actually has been verified this is a true story he was in an elevator with another physician and that physician had a cardiac event standing in the elevator and uh, Dr. Robchek um, grabbed him, put him on a gurney, wheeled him out of the elevator into a room, pulled the cord out of a lampshade, um, and shocked him with it, and revived him. And, they, and he lived another 20 years practicing, I think it was psychiatry, you know, in Charlotte after that. And so that's a, one tidbit about Dr. Robichek, who was a great mentor of mine. So. That's wonderful. So in the spirit of talking about lung cancer awareness, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that people really um, maybe don't quite understand about lung cancer. Um, you know, we have, you know, in our minds, we learn so much about breast cancer and all these other things. Um, but, you know, with the prevalence of lung cancer today, um, is there anything um, where it's been a significant increase in the number of people that are diagnosed with lung cancer each year? We have some facts up here, but um, you know, I know there's been new trends coming out and we see more and more prevalence of it. I think we talked about there was one in 17 women um, are likely to be diagnosed with lung cancer and then one in 15 men. And then I know you have an interesting fact about every how, how many minutes someone gets diagnosed with lung cancer. Well, so, you know, lung cancer is, a, is, is an interesting um, diagnosis to talk about. So, and just, you know, to be frank, um, for many years, um, even decades, um, people who were diagnosed with lung cancer, often the attitude um, in the community, and honestly from, from uh, medical professionals even, was, well, that's, that's your fault. You know, you did this to yourself. You should have known not to smoke. Um, um, you know, there's, there's a, a bunch of um, sort of moralistic thinking about lung cancer and, and why someone gets it um, that slowed down how well we took care of people. So, 
you know, um, you know, a great example of that actually you brought up was uh, you know breast cancer and the Susan uh, Komen Foundation and how much research has been done and the great strides that have been made in breast cancer care, prostate cancer care, uh, colorectal cancer care have all um, you know exploded over the past 30 years. Um, lung cancer is behind, um, and I really think that uh, a good the the probably the most um, reasonable explanation to that is. Um, there was not a lot of research being done because uh, people didn't want to give money to support that research, which is, you know, too bad uh, because, as you said, um, you know, there is, this is one of the most prevalent cancers um, in the United States. Um, you said it right, one in 15 men, one in 17 women, and that's not, that's with no smoking history. So that's all comers. So if you, in fact, do have a smoking history or other risk factors, your, those rates only go up. Um, more importantly though, um, when you're diagnosed with a lung cancer, you're more likely to die from that cancer than you are from many of the other cancers. Lung cancer um, um, is a cause of death um, um, more than breast cancer, or prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer combined annually. So we see um, 240,000 uh, new lung cancers a year. Uh, there's at least um, 130 to 135,000 cancer lung cancer deaths per year, so that's um, over 50% just to start with, um, and uh, and that's the that's a, in 2021 after there's been a lot of good work. In fact, I think the last 10 years have been pretty exciting for us uh, from that standpoint. But um, you know, I think it's I think it's important that people know that um, you don't have to be a smoker to get lung cancer. Um, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to people in their 20s. Um, I've taken care of folks with lung cancer. Um, you know, most commonly, it's uh, it's in older uh, in older people. Uh, the average age is about 70 for people to uh, to be diagnosed with lung cancer. Most commonly, it happens after you know anywhere after 65, and those are most of my patients. But we definitely see even between men and women, the rates of lung cancer actually have been dropping um, over the past few decades because you know anti-smoking um, campaigns have been working. Yeah. Um, that's been that's been proven, um, and uh, we have new screening protocols, which I'm sure I, you know, I'm hoping we're going to be able to talk about tonight, yeah. um, which uh, help to um, you know detect these cancers um, sooner and and achieve um, you know a, a chance for us to to cure um, better than we ever have in the past. Um, but it's really been the drop in in in, uh, in active smoking in, in adults in the United States that has contributed to um, fewer cancers but we're picking up more because we're looking for them more now. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. So um, when talking about you know, people, what are their risk factors? What are risk factors? We talked about smoking. Um, what can increase a person's chance of getting lung cancer? Um, I know there's a lot of myths about certain things. Um, there's some things that people just may not quite understand. So um, what in your um, perspective are some risk factors that people need to pay attention to? Okay, I think that's a great question. Um, I want, I'm gonna come back to smoking because I'm not quite done talking about that. <laughs> um, we, we certainly are gonna, gonna chat. Um, uh, I'll put some vaping aside with that as well. But uh, lung cancer is not just a smoker's disease. Um, you know, probably 10% of the patients that I take care of are either non-smokers or so, smoke so little, uh, you know, social smoking in college, you know, and, and not had one since they were like 26 years old or something, you know. It's, the thing of it is, is that's, um, that's very common and that's not really a risk factor the way that, you know, someone who has a true lifelong habit has. But non-smokers are also at risk and there are a few things that, that stand out um, that are both environmental as well as, um, as, well as you know, family-based genetics. So, um, there is a genetic predisposition to lung cancer. Um, it is not the most common thing. I think um, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, there are a lot of uh, more strongly tied genetic dispositions. But if you have a family member that was a, that was a smoker um, and had lung cancer or a non-smoker had lung cancer, you still have an increased risk in, in either category, regardless of your own uh, personal uh, smoking history. So. Uh, family history is one, and that's something that your doctors would always ask about. Um, environmental exposures are probably the next most important thing. So other than smoke, um, the, the sort of the, the factor that people point to that is the next most um, uh, associated with uh, lung cancer risk is radon exposure. 
Um, radon is a silent um, emission that comes from, uh, from uranium deposits in the ground, which I know sounds sort of strange and esoteric and not meaningful, yeah. but anyone who's buying or selling a house nowadays, um, oftentimes uh, you'll get a radon inspection, and that just involves like a, a detector like this that goes, sits in the house, and you know, for uh, about 24 hours it, it just sort of sits there and picks up whatever's uh, in, the, uh, in the air. Um, and so, um, you know, I would actually highly recommend uh, to people when they are, um, you know, selling real estate that, that that be part of their their process. But all of my non-smokers that I see that have lung cancer, I recommend they get radon testing in their home. Um, other things that are environmental, you know, we all know, um, you know, the guys that you know work the Navy uh, uh, yards in World War II. Um, they were exposed to asbestos in a, in a heavy way. That uh, is a five-fold increase in the chances of lung cancer. And that's regular lung cancer, as well as mesothelioma, which is related to lung cancer, but is not actually lung cancer. But, um, but true lung cancer, uh, especially if you combine smoking and, and asbestos, really increases your risk. And so, you know, we see a lot of those, those guys. And people were exposed, um, you know, in their work to asbestos even you know just normal building up until the 1970s so it's something that you have to uh, pay attention to from that standpoint and then other things can you know can be a little bit more you know out there um, um, arsenic chromium uh, diesel fuels you know so folks who are working in the trucking industry you know what I find interesting about um, about lung cancer risks is that a lot of um, a lot of them have to do with you know people who sort of work the dirty jobs, the ones that, that, you know, the coal miners, you know, the people who are, you know, um, you know, exposing themselves to dust um, and things that you breathe in. Um, I mean, we don't think about the, you know, your lungs are very important. Um, everyone knows that, you know, everyone likes to breathe, but I mean, you don't realize that that's your, your really your number one association with the environment is not even like say your skin it's it's your lungs you're breathing in things constantly you're breathing in um, you know pollutants you're breathing in um, pollen you're, you're breathing in all sorts of things that come in um, not even to mention you know illnesses viruses those kinds of things and the you know your body processes that and uses those exposures to then um, you know to then sort of generate immunity and do other things um, but um, you know, all of these, all of anything that you can expose your lung to that causes inflammation or anything like that can increase your risk of lung cancer. Usually, not very much, and certainly not like smoking uh, tobacco does, especially cigarettes specifically. Um, but um, but there are um, other risk factors as well. Perfect. Um, I, you touched a little bit on the environmental thing. Um, something that I think may be newer to your practice, being in Arizona now, is um, the addition of treating people for valley fever. Um, so this is something I've grown up here my whole life and so I'm familiar with it. Um, we talk about, we have a lot of patients that get the little tiny granulomas and things like that in their lungs. So does someone with valley fever, is that considered a, a greater risk factor to getting lung cancer eventually in life? So everybody who's gone to medical school has heard of valley fever and 98% of physicians in this country have never seen it, right? So that is, I will say that that has been a very interesting transformation in my practice um, coming from North Carolina, and it's really fascinating. You know, um, somebody uh, somebody quoted me this, and I, I haven't looked it up, but it sounds like uh, you know something that is about correct. Um, you know, if you live in Phoenix for 20 years, you're going to have a lung spot, so on scan. And so you know, we talk, and we're going to talk about a little bit about screening and, and taking pictures and that kind of thing. Um, and it's just fascinating to me because um, you know. Everybody is exposed to this, you know, desert fungus. Um, you know, they they tell me it's the um, it's the monsoons, it's the dust storms that really kick that stuff yeah. up, right? Um, and we're all breathing it. So, but you know, it could be worse. We could all be living in Los Angeles and breathing in whatever's out there, right? So that you know, it's you know, the air is very clean here, but that stuff is out there. Any lung infection, uh, valley fever, uh, tuberculosis, um, uh, asthma. Um, 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 you know, anything that causes inflammation does slightly increase your risk for lung cancer. Is it a strong risk? No, it is not. Um, what, what we find more often actually is when we are trying to figure out whether or not somebody with a finding on their, like say, you know, CAT scan of their lung 
whether it even is a cancer. Here it's much more confusing because oftentimes a valley fever spot will mimic a lung cancer and turn out not to actually be lung cancer and so the treatments obviously are different and getting that good diagnosis is very important. So yeah. it, uh, it changes things uh, for how we do workups here in, here in Arizona. That's a um, good point. I mean, so with a lung cancer screening, um, can that help with um, being diagnosed? Can a regular screening, what should people, who should be getting screened for lung cancer? Let's start there and then how often should they get screened? Yep. And then um, is there a reason if they fall outside of those parameters for screening that they should really push their doctor to get them screened? That's, I think that's, those are a fantastic set of questions. So let's, let's talk about lung cancer screening. So lung cancer screening has not been around for very long. You know, everybody knows about mammograms for breast cancer. Everybody knows about colonoscopy for colon cancer, PSAs for prostate cancer. You know, the reason to screen for anything, um, and this is cancer-based or any other kind of um, medical disease, is if you cast a wide enough net, you catch earlier disease that allows you to then intervene and make a difference in terms of people's lives. Now, a lot of this is based in statistics, and statistics are, are kind of funny because no one person is a statistic, right? So what happens to you as an individual you know, is a, it's, a, it's a digital thing. It's a one or it's a zero. Um, you know, you either have lung cancer or you don't. But you're, you know, the population at risk um, is what drives screening programs. So lung cancer screening in 2011, there was a, a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and it basically took a screening program, which was CT scans of the chest with a low dose of radiation and a uh, patient population between the ages of 55 and 74 who had smoked at least 30 pack years uh, over their lifetime um, and um, you screen them annually. So once a year they would get a, a, just that CT scan and just by doing that um, they were able to reduce lung cancer mortality by 20%. So um, that was the big study that sort of kicked that whole thing off. Now it took after that, it still took a long time to get um, you know, uh, Medicare to cover it, which then allowed for um, some of the private insurance uh, to, to come on board. And so actually, when we first were starting this, we were doing CT scans for free, you know, because it was just, it was just good for people. Yeah. Um, and so um, you know, now it is recognized as an important part of, uh, of health maintenance in this country. Um, and uh, those you know, additional studies have come up out of Europe uh, multiple actually that have confirmed uh, what the original study said and so lung cancer screening is here and it's here to stay. Um, the only people who are authorized right now to get lung cancer screening are people who are at high risk um, and you know that's that has to do with smoking so um, it, you know no risk or low risk people are those who have never smoked and who have no additional risk, risk factors Moderate risk people, and that's not to say that that's not no risk, but they don't qualify for screening, are people who are, like, have secondhand smoke exposure, any of these environmental things that we talked about. Um, and so the only people who qualify for lung cancer screening are the high risk folks, and that in this day and age, now in 2021, the, it's, been, it's been widened a little bit. So now we're screening people who are age um, uh, 50 uh, to 80, and uh, 20 pack years uh, as opposed to 30 pack years. And we sort of took the secondary stuff out. So it's very simple. Now, some of you guys might ask, you know, what's a pack year? I'm so just gonna say, I know reference this, that. this it's is a little confusing. Th I it's think, a medical people. it's a medical term. It's how we track how much people have smoked because um, smoking it's not smoking is not a risk factor. That's like, you know, I, I had a, a cigarette when I was 16 um, and now I have a risk of lung cancer. It is additive. So the more that you have smoked, the total amount of cigarettes smoked over your lifetime is increased risk. So a person who smoked two packs a day for 50 years has a higher risk than somebody who smoked a, a pack a year for, for 10. But a pack year is how we try to sort of bring that all together. And what a pack year means is that you have smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for a year. And you know, a lot of people who are active smokers, that's not that hard. You know, it's, it's challenging to smoke three or four packs of cigarettes. You're basically lighting one cigarette right off the, or off the other. Yeah. But, um, but a pack, so if you've smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years, or you smoked half a pack for 40 years, you have 
that equals 20 pack years both sides. You are then a candidate for screening. Um, the other factor for screening is if you quit smoking, you know, and if you did, good for you. Um, if you have quit and it's been more than 15 years, you now no longer fall into the high risk category and you don't need to be screened anymore. Um, so, um, you know, quitting makes a difference, right? So that's, I, that's my takeaway there. Um, although, um, you know, there are folks in the periphery um, who don't meet lung cancer screening cri criteria because they're not high risk. Um, but there are people out there that really wish they could get their screen too. Um, you know, and a lot of the lung cancers that we find, especially in non-smokers, are found incidentally on just like an x-ray done for something else. You know, someone got into a car accident and they decided that they needed a chest x-ray and they see a spot and then the workup proceeds. Yeah. So those are, those are, you know, the folks who are lucky, right? So, but the screening pro program doesn't include them. Okay, so outside of screening, um, is there any symptoms that people should look for, um, you know, if they have a persistent cough or things like that, when should they see their doctor um, for possibly being worked up for some sort of lung issue? Gotcha. Um, so you, you should see your lung, you should see your doctor every year. Yes. I, I mean, that's, I mean, that, let's just start with the basics. You know, we all have health problems. We all have things that we need to be looked at. And, you know, this, this goes for everybody who's a, you know, from a child all the way up to, um, up to uh, an octogenarian. You should see your doctor regularly. You should have a doctor. Let's start with that. You should have a primary care doctor. It's a wonderful thing. Um, now, you know, they're not going to set you up for screening or set you up for tests that are not useful to you. Um, but when you have a relationship with somebody, you're able to bring to them attention, you know, symptoms that maybe, you know, have been bothersome and they, they're concerning, right? So lung cancer is interesting. When it's small and curable, it's often without symptoms. So people don't have a cough. They don't have um, um, fevers. They don't have weight loss. Um, sometimes, um, you know, people will develop pain in their chest. Um, sometimes you'll cough up blood. That's usually the most concerning one. Um, all of those deserve to be looked at, um, and you know, at the very least, a chest X-ray is a reasonable is a reasonable place to start for things that are symptomatic like that. Um, it's been my experience, and forgive me, my primary care brethren, um, people don't get chest X-rays the way they used to. So in the 70s, if you stubbed your toe, you probably got a chest X-ray. Um, that doesn't happen very often anymore, but I think that people don't do them as often as they should. And so when somebody comes in who has persistent, a persistent cough, don't just treat him for pneumonia and, you know, and then see him in a couple of months. You know, I think that those do need to be, um, you know, intentionally looked at, even if they're not technically at high risk for lung cancer, because we want to catch the folks that are low and moderate risk as well. Um, and so I think a chest X-ray is a very valuable tool for that. Um, and, um, you know, and then, you know, talking to people and doing good physical examinations and these kinds of things. But, um, um, you know, that's, uh, that's how I feel about that. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to point out to people watching, um, if you are interested in getting screened for um, seeing if you meet the requirements for a lung cancer screening, you can go to honorhealth.com backslash lung screening and take our quiz on there and see if you meet the requirements. So. Um, so we talked about screening, we talked about risk factors. What about if someone has been diagnosed with lung cancer? So what are the treatment options and what are some of the new technologies that um, we here at Honor Health are offering for our patients? Right, you know, lung, lung cancer care, um, I look at as a team sport, okay? So, um, you know, you have a variety of not just physicians, but other healthcare workers that are involved uh, in taking care of any patient who's diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, so, you know, let's start out with, with a scenario. Um, you know, you've, you're, you're a high risk, um, you smoke 30 packs a day, um, you quit five years ago, you feel really good about it, but your physician recommends that you get a lung cancer screening. So you get set up as an outpatient, you know, meaning that it's just done like in a radiology office and you go and you get a CT scan, doesn't take any contrast, they don't have to start an IV, you just get in the machine and it takes about 20 seconds, zip, zip. Um, you don't have any symptoms, you're not coughing, you're not having any problems. So, um, but they find that on, you know, in your right lung at the top, there's a spot 
And so, you know, we look at these spots a lot, right? So um, the way that we as, you know, uh, physicians and surgeons will, will uh, characterize this has to do with a few different things. You know, how big is it? Is it smooth around the edges or is it sort of jagged, what we call spiculated? Is it, is it a solid nodule or is it more kind of hazy, which we'll call a ground glass opacity? So, you know, these kinds of characteristics um, are there. And then the question is, okay, yeah, well, now we found something. Now what, right? So um, it, it used to be that you had a few different options, um, and none of them were fantastic. One was, we just take you to surgery, we we cut it out, and we see what it is. Um, and by surgery, you mean like the big open right? So production. I'm talking, I'm talking yeah. like you know pre, you know camera surgery, robot yeah. surgery, things that we can do now. Like you know uh, when I first started training. All lung surgery was done open, okay? And it op by open, that means um, an incision along the side like this between the ribs, you know, what we call a thoracotomy. Um, you know, we put these little retractors in there that sort of that you crank open like a, like churning butter, basically. It just sort of opens it up. Um, and, you know, then the lung is exposed and you're able to, to remove what you need to remove. Um, and you did that without even a diagnosis, right? Just to make the diagnosis, we were doing these big surgeries. Um, and so, and then once you did, you know, once you had that diagnosis in hand, you still were able to perform a very good operation. Many people were treated well and, and you know, for all intents and purposes, cured with lung surgery, even in the older era. So that, that's good. Um, you know, uh, in those days too, though, you know, chemotherapy regimens uh, had not been quite uh, worked out um, the way that they are now. Uh, radiation therapy was different. You know, you know, a lot of radiation um, in the old days was what they call conventional. Um, you go for 45 to 55 treatments. You know, it takes almost two months to get through it. You get a lot of radiation damage from that. Um, and so now that we are diagnosing and catching lung cancer early, there's a lot of different things. So. Um, I'll jump into some of the surgeries in a second, but the things that they have done with um, radiation treatment um, is amazing. Stereotactic beam radiation therapy. Sometimes people um, refer to it as cyber knife. That's just one kind. There's a, a few different kinds, but it's really spot treatment of, of cancer. Um, chemotherapy has come a long way. I mean, nowadays, the medical oncologists do a really incredible job with treating people, both with, you know, what is sort of, you know, the standard chemotherapy, but then there's a lot of different kinds of immunotherapies and other targeted treatments that are now for lung cancer. On the surgery side and the diagnostic side um, with uh, my, my colleagues in, in uh, pulmonology, things have really changed a lot. So, um, you know, nowadays uh, we have uh, ways to, to make diagnoses for lung cancer, either CT guided or bronchoscopically, meaning we put a camera down the airway and we can go out to different small nodules um, what we call navigational bronchoscopy, and now actually there's one that's even robotic navigational bronchoscopy, and it's very small and pinpoint and can get out to these nodules and differentiate between a valley fever nodule and a lung cancer so that you're not taking somebody to surgery unnecessarily. Um, when it comes time to do an operation, and there are definitely uh, lung cancer patients that need one. Um, in fact, a lot of our patients that are early stage, that's our standard treatment. Um, we do those now with what we call uh, VATS or video assisted thoracic surgery, which is small camera incisions on the side instead of a big one, um, and uh, robotic video assisted surgery. So um, sometimes people call it RATS, but I don't like that. So <laughs> no. I, don't, I don't call it that, maybe ROVATS. Um, anyway, so we have a, a special surgical robot that has you know, been used in a, in a variety of different specialties, uh, gynecology, uh, urology. Uh, and even general surgery, and now we use it for, for thoracic surgery as well. And so we make small incisions uh, in between the ribs. We dock this monstrosity of a robot to the, to the ports, and then the surgeon um, steps away from the, from the patient's bedside and goes and sits in a little module um, with a binocular vision and sort of these controls and does the surgery that way. So um, you know, by doing that, we're able to um, minimize pain, so a small incision means less pain, means less hospital stay. Um, even rates of mortality and rates of complications. So complications and death, fewer just by not doing a thoracotomy, just by doing small little incisions. Um, and so for us, that's kind of a slam dunk. So um, you know, the state of the art in surgery nowadays is minimally invasive surgery 
um, for, for lung cancer because people do better. It takes less time. People are out of the hospital in two or three nights. They're not there for seven to nine nights. Um, you know, um, long-term pain um, is, is much less of a problem. Um, and so um, one of the things that I was tasked with, actually, when I was recruited here um, um, uh, by my partner, Dr. Riley, was to really push forward minimally invasive thoracic surgery. So, um, you know, here at Honor Health, uh, we're able to do that um, uh, at, at all of our locations. And it's, uh, it's just been a real uh, improvement in the, in the care of the patients in the community. Um, from that standpoint. Now, r r repeat your question for me, because we I, I was talking about that, but there was something else that you wanted to know. So, um, with our, we have potential treatment options too, so I wanted, what, the other thing I wanted to touch on though was with the um, robotics and the other, all these kind of, we're coming along with all these new technologies, um, do you feel like, and has the research and clinical trials shown that um, the accuracy of it is better and we can um, have a, less time from identification of a tumor really to treatment and making you know the potential survival of this even greater than had they waited longer for it to be detected uh, so it's a good question so we're going to try and break this down yeah. a little bit because this that's a there's a lot of layers to that topic <laughs> all right so let's start with lung cancer survival <clears throat> um, it, it seems reasonable and it's very logical to assume that the smaller a lung cancer the more likely that a person is going to survive it this is true, we know this, okay? So um, I tell patients um, who come into my office, and if any of you guys are watching, you're gonna hear the spiel that you heard when you saw me. Um, we really have three questions that we have to answer when somebody walks in with a lung nodule. What is it? If it's a cancer, what stage is it? And then based on that, what are we gonna do about it? Okay, so that is that breaks down everything when it comes to coming up with a plan for cancer care. So. Figuring out what it is. So if someone has a nodule and we got it, we have to make a diagnosis. You know, we just talked about it. in the old days. We you know we cut it out. Um, the interventional radiologists that work in our system and and nationally have gotten incredibly good at doing what's called a CT guided biopsy, where they actually will will under live imaging put a needle into the lung and sample it that way, and so they can get very good diagnostics you know, encroaching upon 90% accuracy um, at a little bit of a risk. You know, whenever you put a sharp thing in the lung, you know, there can be lung collapse, there can be bleeding, there are some other things that happen. Any procedure that anybody gets, there's always some risk. Mm -hmm. But it's low risk, and they do a, a wonderful job. That changed a lot of things. We were able to make early diagnoses. If we found uh, things were benign, people didn't get surgery. But there were you know, a fair number of patients that still didn't get a diagnosis, and those folks would end up in surgery too. And there we would actually do uh, an operation with the small cameras, and we'd take out the spot, and we'd make a diagnosis that way. And sometimes you still have to do that. Um, the other ways that we tried to come up with um, sort of less invasive ways to make a diagnosis, things like coughing up sputum and sending it out for slides, um, doing blood tests, uh, we still haven't found a good one for that for lung cancer, although I know people are working on it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't, have an, we don't have accurate testing that way. Chest x-rays didn't work well. Um, the pulmonologists doing bronchoscopies and doing washings and these kinds of things that they used to do, um, you know, works if it's a big cancer, but not if it's a small one, it's not very helpful. So, um, so the latest technology is this uh, robot navigational bronchoscopy where we take a very tiny camera and we can take it all the way from the main windpipe out to any part of the lungs and, and do biopsies that way. It is an excellent complement to CT guided biopsies because a lot of these lung nodules are, are actually sort of central in the lung and you don't want anybody putting a needle all the way through your lung to get to that and so we can come at it from the inside. So diagnostics now, 90% of the time, we can tell people what they have before we have to do an operation or get any, or you know, go any further than that. So that's the what is it. Yeah. The next thing that would happen to you if you were diagnosed with a lung cancer is you would then be staged, okay? And what staging means is we figure out, is this thing just a little spot that's just right there or has this thing spread out everywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. And so staging is very important to us because that helps us to determine what's gonna go on. So um, everyone who has a lung cancer diagnosed will get a PET scan. So I don't know if you guys have heard of PET scans, but a PET scan is like, it's kinda like a CAT scan 
and I don't know why they came up with pet and cat, but there it is. <laughs> um, but it's a little bit more to it. So what they do is um, you come into, you know, to where the pet scanner is because it's a specialized machine and they start an IV and they give you a little uh, solution. Now that solution is basically a sugar molecule. So it's like, it's like sugar water, but it also happens to have a little tiny radioactive tracer on yes. it. It's not radioactive. You're not going to turn into Spider-Man. <laughs> that doesn't happen. It's just a tracer. And so what happens is, is that travels to everywhere in your body and anything that's using up a lot of energy concentrates this sugar solution in there and it glows on the detector. And so I tell people there are things that are going to glow that are natural. Your heart muscle is constantly beating. It glows. You know, your kidneys glow because that's where all the sugar ends up. Your brain, which uses nothing but glucose for energy, glows really bright. So all of those things are normal, but in the lungs, the lungs themselves do not glow like that. And so when it shows up hot, and people talk in PET scans for us, we talk hot or cold, um, if it shows up hot, it's concerning. Now, you know, from just a, an Arizona Valley fever perspective, Valley fever nodules show up hot too, right? Because little infections will do the same thing. So that helps us to make some plans. Um, it certainly helps us to rule out extensive cancers, things that show up in the bone or the liver or someplace else. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you, yes, you have cancer, or no, you don't, unless you've already gotten the biopsy. So um, the other thing that, that would happen if you had something extensive, um, a PET scan, like I said, the brain glows, so that's not very good for, a, for, for the brain. So some people might also get a brain MR, yep. an MRI of the brain. So those two tests together go, uh, will determine your stage, and then based on that, we figure out what to do about it. So. Breaking this down a little as simply as as possible and I'm going to tell you guys that staging has been has been is changing all the time So we're in our eighth handbook for staging all cancers over the past, you know 25 years and they are they are getting more and more complex because more and more Research is being done. They're able to split hairs between little things. It's getting you know It's always complicated. I have the little manual in my pocket when I see patients because you know I'm an expert at this and I can't remember yeah, it all because there's a just lot. a lot of information. But, but just to break it down is in broad strokes, if you've got a lung spot that's a cancer and you don't have any spread to the lymph nodes or any place else, that is stage one. If you've got some lymph nodes close by and we look for those two, um, that's probably stage two. If, you're sort of, if the lymph nodes have gotten to the center part of your chest, that's stage three. And then anything that's sort of spread out beyond that, you know. To another else. organ or bone or tissue. Correct, correct. right. So, and lung, lung favors bone, brain, mm -hmm. um, and adrenal gland for, you know, for reasons, the little things that sit on top of your kidneys. Um, and, um, and we'll find those there. Um, and so that would be your staging. And so people who are stage one and most people who are stage two uh, benefit from surgery. So those are folks that will get an operation from me if they're well enough to, to tolerate it. Um, if you're stage three or four, surgery is not helpful. Um, in fact, it can delay your treatment. And so we, we guide people away from surgery and into different things, which would include chemotherapy and radiation um, or some of this immunotherapy that, that's been talked about now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where this whole team-based approach is. A surgeon, you know, even one who specializes in this is not the only team member, you know, uh, and I talked about this before, cancer care in this day and age is a team sport. So here's my, my, my only sports analogy for the night. <laughs> um, lung cancer is like football. Mm -hmm. um, as the cancer surgeon, you know, I feel like we're the quarterback. It's kind of shiny. We do some, uh, some things that are technically impressive. Um, we feel like we're really important but actually we're only one member of 11 teams, but we think we're important, you know, so that's the, that's the thing there. So we think we are. The medical oncologist is the coach. They're putting together the plans. They're drawing up the plays. Um, they are enlisting their uh, chemotherapy team to deliver medications. Uh, radiation oncologists, they're the kickers. They're underrated, but they're putting points on the board all the time. And so I think that they are super, super important. But then there's the patient. Patient's the owner of the team. So they're not a spectator. They're not buying hot dogs and sitting down and sort of watching how things are going. You know, they are the ones, you know, they are, they, they are the ones calling the shots, making the decisions, firing the coaches, hiring the coaches, personnel stuff. 
And so, you know, whenever, you know, we engage our patients in like their treatment plan, we want them to feel like they have ownership over what's going on. And so um, you put all these folks together um, and, and you're actually, and then you're cooking. You're taking care of people yeah. the, the way that they're supposed to be taken care of. I think that's a great analogy. It's really important for um, patients to kind of be so closely involved in their care and, and to find their team. Um, in this process, especially with something really as scary as lung cancer, so. Well, and it, it's, like I said, it's hard. I mean, it's complicated even for people who are, you know, expert trained. And so for a patient to come into the room um, and express an opinion about their care is really brave, you know, because people feel intimidated um, and and they don't want to offend anybody or they, or they really, or, or sometimes they just, they just don't, know what the information all means. And that's perfectly reasonable, um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that they are actually still the ones in charge. And so, you know, when I take care of pa patients that have these diagnoses, if at all possible, you know, I encourage them, bring family members with you. You know, even in this day and age of COVID, you know, we're still allowing people to bring, to bring their support network with them because, you know, you only remember so much that you hear, you only remember so much that you see, and if you have additional people in there with you, um, it's better, right? Yeah, you just remember definitely. more. And so when you bring your support care team with you, you know, you write things down. Bring your list of questions. Bring your list of questions patients, yeah. all the time. I think yeah. that's a great idea. I, and even after I first see a, a patient, I'll tell them the questions are gonna pop up that you've forgotten to ask. Write them down now. It's like having a dream journal on your bedside. Have yes. a list that you keep around that you maybe you tack it to the refrigerator and you write it down as you go. When you come back, we'll go through your questions again and we'll answer them all again. And you deserve to know everything that we know. Our job is to, is to facilitate and to educate and to allow you to make the decision that you feel like is right for you. Now, does that mean I don't have an opinion? No, that's not what that means. I have an opinion. And usually it's the right one, um, but it's, you know, I will give good advice. All of the doctors that take care of these folks give good advice. Um, but like anything, there are gray areas. So there's, you know, sometimes it's a black and white decision. Sometimes it's what's best for you. You know, are you really at, you know, 97 going to want chemotherapy? Maybe not. You know, maybe we got to figure, you know, that we got to treat people holistically. Um, and that way, you know, everyone gets the best plan. They might not get the same stuff. But for them, it's the best plan. Yep. I think that's a good note because I think um, sometimes people think um, cancer care is one size fits all. And it's definitely not. It's very individualized and um, it's something deeply personal to the patient that is super important to find your team, ask your questions, and find what's going to work for you. Right. So, yeah. You know, and I think it's important that people know that, um, you know, there are a lot of specialists. You know, we're lucky, actually, I would say, you know, uh, living here in Phoenix. Um, and the surrounding areas, um, there are a lot of experts. There are a lot of specialists here. You know, if you meet with somebody and you don't like them, that's gonna be an impediment to your care. So if I meet with somebody and they're like, you know what, that guy Gillespie, we just didn't vibe. He felt like he was a jerk, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's possible, I'm not saying it's likely, but it's possible. <laughs> it's okay to look for somebody else that maybe you mesh with a little bit better. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, you don't want to delay care. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that, you know, so you don't want to like shop around for months until you figure out what you're, what's going on. You want to sort of move things along, but um, you got to have your team. I think, that, I think that you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Um, so I think the next thing we're going to do, um, is there any other things you'd like to kind of make sure that patients understand about, um, about this, the journey through lung cancer? I mean, Obviously, we said making sure, you know, knowing your risk factors, getting screened if you meet the requirements for being high risk, um, for getting screened for lung cancer. Um, if you unfortunately are diagnosed with lung cancer, I think the biggest thing that you said that was super important, finding your team, finding your comfort, finding someone that you trust to take care of you. Um, and I think that's something that we've done really well here at Honor Health with our, you know, really engaged multidisciplinary teams and um, care navigation and things like that. So. Um, yeah, anything else that you want to add to that piece? I think the only thing I'd say is just statistically speaking, you know, and I think, um, you know, sometimes people come in uh, to see us and we're telling them that they have lung cancer and they think that it's a death sentence. Um, and, you know, lung cancer survival um, is not 
high compared to many other cancers. And there's just no way around that. You know, um, overall, you know, most of the folks I see, 80% are advanced stage, 20% are early stage. What's really interesting about lung cancer is that if you're stage four, your chances of being alive in five years is somewhere around like 5%. You know, so 95% of people are gonna be dead in five years, but not all of them. Um, if you have an early stage lung cancer, let's say you have a, what we call a stage 1A, uh, or even actually it's even a 1A1, and that means that you have a nodule that is one centimeter in size, which is like as big as my pinky nail and smaller, and no lymph nodes and uh, no evidence of metastasis. If you have treatment for lung cancer, which in that case would be surgery, your chances of being alive in five years is 92%. So your swing between stage one, 1A1, one one, the earliest stage, and stage four is 92% versus 5%. So how in the world does that not make it obvious that we need to shift the stage, catch these earlier, you know, do the screening, find the nodules, work them up appropriately. Yeah. If we're doing that, then instead of seeing 80% of people at stage three and four, we're gonna see 80% of people at stage one and two, and we're gonna have a lot more survivors yes. walking around. And I think, I think that people need to know that they can take ownership of their own care um, and, and push it forward. And this is, you know, people should be talking about this um, all the time. If, you, if you're an active smoker, and you're over 50, you should be getting screened once a year. And you know, that's, that's, just the, that's just the basics of what we do. The only thing that's better than screening is convincing people not to smoke to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's something that I think is very important. So um, you know, something that sort of is my pet peeve right now is uh, the, um, the, the phenomenon of uh, electronic cigarettes as if they're less dangerous than actual cigarettes. Actually, they are less dangerous, but only a little bit. And actually, most of the people that use e-cigarettes as teenagers go on to become regular cigarette users. And the only reason why the FDA has approved anything for that, and they did actually just recently approve one, was as a device to help people who are smokers to cut down on their smoking and eventually quit. So it should be a tool like nicotine gum or the patches, but it's not really being used like that. You know, people buy the real fancy ones. We've got the lights and the spinners and this kind of stuff. It looks like bubble gum candy. And that just drives me crazy. So if there's anything that I, we could do better than screening, it's to, it's to convince people not to smoke in the first place because that would, that would solve 90% of the lung cancers that we take care of. Um, I think we have a few questions to go to. Um, Amanda, do you want to give us a couple? Sure. Uh, the first one is, if I need chemotherapy, should genetic testing be done on my tumor? Okay. Um, not a surgery question, um, <laughs> but that's okay. So, um, so some of these questions um, have come through the website, um, you know, as we were, as we were preparing for our talk today. Um, and um, like I said, this is a team-based sport, so um, I shot a little call out to my colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Tsai uh, with uh, Arizona um, uh, Cancer Care, and he gave me an answer. So um, the answer is maybe. It depends. And the reason for that is it depends if the treatment is going to be changed by the results of that genetic testing. So for instance, if you've got a lung cancer that's, that's one centimeter and we're offering you surgery and that surgery is what we believe is curative, there's not really a good reason to do genetic testing because you're done. You've gotten your care. You don't, you're not gonna be a candidate for, um, for chemotherapy or for any of the immunotherapies and that kind of stuff. Um, but I'll tell you a secret that's not really a secret. Uh, that tumor we take out of you does not get thrown away. Um, it gets saved. So if hypothetically, four years down the road, you're one of the unlucky 8% where you get a recurrence, that tumor is saved and that genetic profile can be done at that time and potentially open up treatment for you. Now, you know, and this is, this is also changed in five years because five years ago, all of that stuff was so expensive that we were very careful about who got what sent and this kind of thing. Nowadays, um, the, there are a lot of different companies that, that have provided testing 
which in a competitive market means the prices go down and we have more tools. There's more types of immunotherapy. There's more types of targeted treatments. Um, and so we have a wider range of being able to do something with that. So if you're advanced stage three, four, automatically it's getting sent. And that's happening right now. The gray zone for us is stage two. Some folks kind of meet that criteria and some don't. And that's where you get the smart people in the room to talk about it and to come up with a plan and decide whether or not it's right for you. Great. Do we have another one? Can having lifelong issues with bronchitis and newly diagnosed COPD increase my risk of getting lung cancer? Um, so the answer is yes, but not a lot. Um, you know, um, asthma, um, bronchitis, um, are um, inflammatory diseases of the lung. And so, yes, they increase your risk slightly, um, but not enough to make you a candidate for cancer screening. Now, that being said, most people who have a COPD diagnosis have a COPD diagnosis because they're smokers, because mm -hmm. smoking affects a lot of things. It's not just lung cancer and, and, and lung health. It affects uh, rates of uh, high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, liver disease, um, so um, other kinds of cancer, bladder cancer, uh, head and neck cancer, breast cancer. Um, so smoking is a, affects a lot of different organs. Um, but um, you know, just having a diagnosis of bronchitis may be a smidge, but, but not, not very much. Any other ones? Yes, a few more. Um, how big does a nodule or mass have to be before I have any treatment options? Um, it just has to be apparent on imaging. So it used to be before we had a lot of these advanced things that we'd catch a nodule and if it was really small, say less than a centimeter, um, it would be so hard to get to um, and people didn't really want to just go ahead and get like a big you know, lung cancer surgery that we would watch it. So you would basically repeat a, a CAT scan in three months, maybe six months. Um, and then see if it grows. You know, what's scary about that is then you have something that's growing and, it's a, and it potentially is a cancer and you haven't fixed it. Now it's been three to six months and you know, you're still there. Um, the earlier we catch something, so if we take something out that's six millimeters in size, um, you're gonna do much better even than if it's 1.2 centimeters. And I, I'm sorry about millimeters and centimeters. We talk about that stuff all the time. So. You know, um, it doesn't translate very well for us in inches. But um, if it's really small, you want to catch that early. So, you know, diagnostics now are advanced enough that if it's, you know, six millimeters or bigger, we have a good shot at it. Um, PET scans are not very helpful in these really tiny nodules, though, so we have to adjust things. So with any diagnosis of lung cancer, and it doesn't matter how big or small it is, you have options. What is the typical recovery like for someone after surgery? Um, so it depends on the kind of surgery that you have, but if we're talking about sort of what we feel is the, is the state of the art grade A surgery, it's, it's, um, it's robotic, it's minimally invasive. Um, average length of stay in the hospital is probably two nights. Um, I send people home sometimes the next day. They're pretty rare. Keeping people longer than four nights is pretty rare also. Most everybody falls in between. Um, there's sort of three phases of recovery. There's that time in the hospital where you, you, know, you don't feel great, um, you're recovering from incisional pain and that kind of thing. Then you go home and for about one to two weeks, you're still really tired, you're fatigued, you're working, you're doing stuff at about 80%, but you really don't feel like yourself. And then somewhere after that two week mark, somewhere between two and six weeks, everybody turns a corner and all of a sudden it's like, they have to be reminded they had surgery. So, so you know, you know, an operation, and this goes for all of them, but, you know, an operation on, on the lungs, you know, it takes a little while to get over, but, but long term, people do incredibly well. Um, so speaking of kind of the, you know, robotics and things like that, what percentage of your, um, like, total volume of cases do you feel like, have you seen a, like a larger shift over into the robotics side of things versus the more traditional, yeah, my, less you new? Know, my, my career has really bridged all this. Yeah. Um, when I started out as a, as a resident, everything was open. Um, when I chose my fellowship, one of the reasons that I chose to, to train in Charlotte was because they were like all in on VATS, video assisted thoracic surgery, and that was the state of the art at the time. And so we did all of our work that way. 
about three years into my practice, um, which previously was in North Carolina, um, you know, the robotic stuff, which had always been present, um, really started to take hold because of some new advances in technology um, that, that made the surgeries more applicable to what we were doing. Um, and, you know, we were early adopters and we took off. So I would say 90% of the lung cancer surgery that I do is done robotically and most of the rest of it at least is done partly robotically. So um, I think, at least in my hands, it's made a huge difference in, in how I take care of patients. That's great. Um, do we have any other questions? One more. Okay. Do you see the screening guidelines changing anytime soon? So um, the, the ones that we've talked about, 50 to 80 with a 20 pack year smoking history, those are brand new. Those have changed really within the past year. Um, uh, even now, uh, uh, some ins insurances, in fact, I think a lot of them, don't cover that. They cover only the older uh, population, um, in part because the, the, the older criteria meant that only about 8 million people in the country were candidates for screening. Under the new criteria, about 14 million people are candidates for screening. So they got to pay for more screening. And, you know, those, those guys don't like that so much. Um, and so um, convincing people to, to, to really take care of people in the way that the, the expert societies recommend is, is part of the challenge. But I think that this screening um, um, protocol for now is going to be the way it is at least for five years. Um, but things change. But things change. Um, so I don't think we have any other questions. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. This was fun. Lindsay, I appreciate <laughs> you. So um, y'all may not know us, but Lindsay um, and I have been working together um, since I got here. She's, uh, she's uh, one of the directors of our uh, cardiovascular service line and has been integral um, in uh, us building this program. Um, and so it's been a pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You, yeah. um, we also want to say thank you to everybody who tuned in uh, to, the, uh, to the talk tonight. Um, you know, just like I tell my patients, it's not the last time you get a chance to ask questions. So if people uh, want to know more, yes. um, they can always reach out um, to the uh, Honor Health. Uh, what's the website? So you, on honorhealth.com, um, or if you missed getting your question in tonight, you can also send um, it to our email at lungcare at honorhealth.com as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, and if you're feeling like you're at risk and you need a screen, talk to your primary care doctor. Uh, if you don't have a primary care doctor, you know, talk to us. We'll help you with that. So um, we just want to make sure that everybody uh, in this community is well taken care of. Yeah. So anyway, thank you again and uh, good night. Thank you.